you would stand as we read this. In that day, you will say, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you are angry with me, your anger has turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. I love these calls to worship uh, like this because they always include this element of going and telling. Make this made known all over the earth. Make it made known uh, among the nations so that all might learn who God is and want to worship him through us. So we want to be faithful to uh, share what we have been entrusted with as we heard Sunday morning and uh, proclaim the gospel everywhere we go. Let's sing together about God's grace. in the song.
again, let's pray and call the Lord as my salvation. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from a raging sea. the solid ground, the Lord is my salvation, I will not fear when darkness falls, His strength will help me scale these walls, I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. Salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save faithful love? My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Each promise of his word when winter fades, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, times of need, when I know lost, when I my final day. He will not leave me in the grave, but I will rise and will call me home. The Lord is my salvation.
nothing left for us to do because Christ has done it all. And yeah, I pray that that message of hope would be on our lips as we uh, are here with one another, encouraging one another, spurring one another on. And then, God, as we leave, uh, that you would remember this treasure that we hold in these jars of clay, uh, this gospel message that is meant to be uh, spread uh, to those who are destitute. God, will you help us uh, feel the depth of the error in the world and show our hearts to worship you. Thank you for this gift you've given us. I pray that you would be magnified and glorified here in our midst. We thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, don't the shoeboxes look good? Man, just uh, think of the uh, great places in ministry, the various places those will uh, those will go and be blessings to people that uh, uh, they're doing that to me again. Oh, was it? Thought it was last time, and I turned around. You weren't doing anything. It kept doing that. Well, that, that is me. Uh, if we can bend that just a little bit, I don't know. We'll just make that do. All right, let's look at uh, the book of Amos here. And uh, I'll do as usual. I'll back up just a tiny bit uh, so we can um, uh, <coughs> get a running start where we were in uh, uh, chapter 3, and uh, we had looked at, uh, I'll read verses 13 to 15 again to get us uh, in place sort of where we, where we were, where we left off. Um, he says, Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts. For on that day I will punish Israel's transgressions. I will also punish the altars of Bethel, the horns of the altar will be cut off, and they will fall to the ground. I will smite the winter house together with the summer house. The houses of ivory will also perish, and the great houses will come to an end, declares the Lord. So again, he is speaking his words of judgment on a nation that has uh, broken the covenant that they made with him. Uh, that is uh, living in various kinds of, of sin, social injustices. <clears throat> and uh, he's describing them uh, basically what's going to happen. And remember, we've said the beautiful thing about these prophets, and, and nobody excels Amos on this, is to uh, uh, present this in a very picturesque, uh, imaginative way, <clears throat> you know, that conjures up ideas in the minds of those who first heard it, and we hope ours. He's, he talks about the uh, verse 14 there. He's going to punish Israel's transgressions and punish the altars of Bethel. <clears throat> now, Bethel, if you remember, was one of the places where, in fact, it's probably the place that, that he is preaching from right at, at the time. That was one of the places where the, the false shrines were built and uh, the people were there worshiping contrary to what God had told them to do. Uh, and so he says he's going to punish uh, uh, Bethel. Uh, again, that was a preeminent, that's basically a condemnation of their religious system that is op in opposition to God. But notice what he says, it's very interesting. When he says uh, uh, at the end of the last half of 14, the horns of the altar will be cut off and they will fall to the ground. Now, what, what, why would that matter? What is that? Now, <clears throat> in a lot of religions in the ancient world, and it seems like here God allowed that even in uh, their temple, on the altar, of course, which was a, a flat table, on each of the corners there were little stubs sticking up or whatever. It looked like horns, a small horn on a goat or something. That's what he's talking about. <clears throat> and the purpose of those was if a person was in serious trouble with the law, <clears throat> if they went into the temple, now folks, that's the, the holy place, and they got to the altar and they grabbed a hold of one of those horns on the altar, they were to have some kind of, of sanction because they were being protected by the gods, so to speak, because they were on the place of that altar and <clears throat> where sacrifices were offered up, and it was understood, at least by most, again, that if you got there, as long as you were there, you had the protection of the gods. Now, if you want to, you can have time later on. In 1 Kings, 
the first couple of chapters, we have an example of that actually happening twice. Uh, in, in 1 Kings 1, uh, chapter 50, uh, this is where Adonijah is fleeing from Solomon after Solomon has become the king. Ad, Ad, Adonijah has tried to oppose him, and he knows that's going to cost him his life, and so he runs and he grabs hold to the horn of the, uh, of the altar. The same thing happens in the second chapter of 1 Kings uh, when it's Joab. Joab had actually supported Adonijah in his rebellion against Solomon, and so he does uh, the same thing. <clears throat> okay? So they supposedly have protection. You're not supposed to. Uh, in other words, folks, it would almost, you know, it's not exactly like, but, you know, if somebody was in trouble and they ran for refuge in the church sanctuary, so, hey, this is the holy, this is where God meets us, you know, you, know you, you, have to, you have to act right in the Lord's house, you know. Well, they're not only in the Lord's house, they're at the altar and they're holding on to that horn and that's supposed to protect them. But notice what he says in the end of verse 14. They're going to fall to the ground. Uh, now, again, that's figurative. Right when they need that protection from their false religion, Somebody's going to imagine Adonijah running. He's, Solomon and his people's right behind him. He runs into the temple and he starts to grab the thing of the altar and it falls to the ground. Says, oh no. You know, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> well, God's telling them that's what's going to happen to them in that day of judgment. <clears throat> the things that they have depended on for their security are not going to be there. That's going to include, as we'll say, particularly their money. <laughs> Their finances that have gotten them, you know, all the pleasures that they have. Their worship, the temple itself, is going to be gone. Your false places of worship. These things that you have counted on are not going to help you at the time you need them the most. Only God is going to help us at that time. <clears throat> and folks, that certainly says something to us today, whether we're believers or anybody else. Uh, to trust in anything other than the Lord is going to be futile. In the day of judgment, the thing in which you have found your hope, if it's in something other than God, in anything in which you found your hope is going to be useless. Okay, It is not going to be there when you need it the most. And so that's what he means there when he talks about the, uh, the, these, uh, the horns of the altar are going to fall to the ground. And everybody knew what that meant. A person running to grab the horn, looking for sanctuary, looking for, for protection, and those things are not going to help us. Uh, folks, material things are not going to help us when it comes to the end of our lives, and it's not going to help us when the judgment of God comes. And of course, we're trusting that we are under the blood of, uh, of Christ. Now, he says there where the judgment is going to fall. That's going to fall on the whole land, but notice he's always singling out the places that are most prominent. And, and notice what he does in um, uh, verse 15, I'm going to smite the winter house together with the summer house. These are what one person called, these are the two house families he's talking about. They're so wealthy, they've got a winter home and a summer home. <clears throat> and, and notice the, the ivory uh, these are luxurious homes. And he says these are going to fall under judgment. Now remember, neither Amos nor anybody else in the Bible ever condemns people for being wealthy. Okay? That's not the problem. The problem is always two things concerning wealth if there's a problem. How did you get that wealth? And what are you doing with that wealth? Uh, and that was a strike against the the. Uh, prominent people in Amos's day on both counts. How did they get this money? Well, for the most part, they got it through oppressing other people, uh, buying, by uh, being dishonest in their business practices, and then oppressing the poor. You know, if there's a, a law case against them, when a person says, well, I'm going to have to take this to court, this wealthy person did for me, well, they just pay off the judge, and the, the person gets no justice or whatever. And so the people were getting richer and richer. And then not only that, they were not doing anything at all to help the poor. So how did they get their wealth? In unsavory ways. What were they doing with it? Using to oppress other people. 
And that's why he's saying there's something wrong. It's going to be your houses that are going to be uh, destroyed. Now notice it's two types of houses. It's the houses that they live in, but it's also going to be uh, the, uh, when he says the houses, he's been talking about verse 14 there, boom, back up there, the altars of Bethel, their worship places are going to be gone as well. So the luxury houses, that represents basically their treasures. Okay? That's, your, that's the things you have found monetary value in and pleasure in. He said, I'm going to strike those. <laughs> There's going to be judgment in those very places where you have enjoyed uh, 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 your uh, material gains and then your worship. You always think you're safe just because you're worshiping. You can do all these things you want, but he has basically told them before and hinting at again here, it's going to be your temples as well. They're going to be destroyed. So your religious life and your financial prosperity are going to be under the judgment of God and you're going to lose both of them when the judgment of God comes and as we're going to continue to see here it's the Assyrians that he's talking about these houses that you've dwelt in are going to be reduced to rubble these worship places that you have gone to find some kind of satisfaction and to appease your conscience somehow they're going to be gone the very things that you have trusted the most are going to let you down. They are not going to see you through the judgment. Now, <clears throat> when we go into chapter 4, let's look at verses 1 through 3. These are very interesting. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the, uh, the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. The Lord has sworn by his, the Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through the breaches of the wall, each one straight before her, and you will be cast into Harmon, declares the Lord. So <clears throat> Amos is now turning to a specific group of those high society people, and that's the wives. It's focusing their attention on them. They too were growing wealthy at the expense of the poor people. Okay? Now, he, he refers to them as you, you bunch of cows uh, of Bashan. <clears throat> uh, Bashan was a very fertile area. If you, sort, if you can see a sort of you picture a map of Israel in the, the um, uh, northwest Transjordan, very fertile, and so it produced cattle that were very, I'll be nicer than Amos was, very healthy, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so everybody knew about the cows of Bashan. That's, that was a, a pride of the people. Uh, fat, healthy, the kind that you would use to, to make your steak or whatever else. And he refers to them as basically you bunch of fat cows. Now, let's make sure we understand he's not, He's not making fun of them because they're fat. That's not the point. Okay? The point is how they got fat. Okay? Uh, by lying around and doing nothing in their luxury and encouraging their husbands to continue what they were doing so it'll support their lifestyle. Okay? That's basically what he's condemning here. Uh, the women saying to their husband, go out and do whatever you have to do to get more money. I'm running. I don't have any new clothes that I bought later. The husband said, we don't have any money. Well, you know how to get some. <laughs> you know, do whatever you have to do with your unsavory practices. And so uh, he's, he's condemning them because of their role. Uh, folks, remember uh, the, the, the uh, Proverbs woman, the Proverbs 31. Uh, uh, she's desirable because she's industrious. You know, uh, she's productive. That's exactly the opposite of what these people are that he is, uh, he's condemning here. And so while these, these poor people were toiling, just as they used to say, to keep uh, body and soul together, uh, they're out pampering themselves and encouraging their husbands in these unprincipled activities, whatever you have to do to get me more chocolates so I can sit in front of the TV and lie around and do nothing and you enjoy life, 
just keep on doing what you are doing here. So they're oppressing the poor. Now notice, folks, there's lessons for us here. They're not doing that directly. They're not doing any of that. Okay? They're, they're simply encouraging that. They're encouraging their husbands to do that. Be a part of these injustices or whatever else to meet my needs here. And so when we think about these women, I think there's a couple of things of principles about sin and guilt that it actually teaches us here. Uh, first of all, folks, sin is more a matter of the heart than it is a matter of the hand. It originates always in the heart. Now, the activity, there's an activity that may follow that, but it originates in the heart. Sin is something in the heart. These, these wives, they're actually not doing any of it. They're not sinning, in a sense, we would say, with their hands. They're not doing any of these things, but what are they doing? They're encouraging their husbands to do it. Why? To meet their desires. So it's, it's the condition of their own heart. And so they are involved in this just as much. They have this love for pleasure, and it's their love for pleasure that is leading to the sin. So remember, sin originates in the heart. That's why the book of Proverbs talks about in, in many places, guard the heart. It's the wellspring of our activity. It's, it's, it's the condition of the heart that determines what we're actually going to do in sinful things. So they weren't here the doers, <laughs> okay? If you say, show me what I actually did wrong, you couldn't say, oh, well, I'll show you. <laughs> yeah. What you did wrong is in your heart. Okay? It, it, it's, it's your desires that you have, have had. And so that is true, of course, not only them, that's true of us as well. Guard the heart. Guard the heart. That is the wellspring of our entire being. It's the heart. Well, again, they weren't sinning with the hands. They weren't the ones actually doing these things. But it was the sinful desires that they had that was actually encouraging it, which leads us to a second thing about sin. There is a such thing as complicity in sin. A person may not be the one to do it, but somehow they may encourage in some way others to do it. They somehow set the stage for somebody else to do it and encourage them to do it, and they are equally guilty, you know? A person can go in and, and rob a bank, you know? Uh, they may even pull a trigger and shoot someone, but the person that's waiting for them in the getaway car is complicit, okay? They are involved in that as well. They are a part of it. They have encouraged it. They have, but whoever plans it may not have been the one who goes in the, uh, in the bank. I was reading just the other day of the, uh, <clears throat> the trial of the people <clears throat> that were uh, uh, a part of the conspiracy in the death of Abraham Lincoln. You know, one of them was a woman, the first woman, uh, Mary Surratt, the first woman that was ever uh, uh, received capital punishment by the hands of the federal government. Uh, she was complicit was what was that? She was John, she was not John Wilkes Booth, okay? <clears throat> but she did own a, a tavern and sort of what we would call today a motel where these people who were planning, first of all, to kidnap Lincoln, it wasn't to kill him first, to kidnap him, and they were meeting at her home and every reason was given to believe that she was actually a part of bringing these people together and facilitating things for them to do what they did. She didn't do it. Okay, but she was hanged for it because she was complicit in it. She was involved. The same thing can be true with sin. Uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is not only are we sinning, but are we doing anything that places a temptation before somebody else that may lead them to sin? You say, well, I didn't do it. Yeah, but did we set the stage for it to happen? Okay. Uh, were we involved in some way without particular? Well, that's the condition that these uh, so-called cows of Bashan were in. They weren't actually doing it, but Amos is saying, you're going to be held responsible as, as well. And certainly Amos never indicates that any of these women stood up for the poor, you know, and opposed what their husbands were doing and saying, yes, we enjoy our luxury and all, but you're not treating people. There's no indication that that was true. They were encouraging it. And so they are singled out by Amos 
to be under the judgment of God just as much so as are their husbands. Now, when you look at verse 2, you see uh, God's settled resolve to do something about the situations that they are in, to bring judgment. He is so adamant in telling them what, that this is going to come that he actually takes an oath. I'm giving you my word. You know, when people go to court, at least in most cases, they hold the Bible up, put your hand on the Bible. You know why? Because that's at least supposedly to them a holy book. Most of them don't believe that, but either way, you're putting your hand on the word of God and you're swearing your oath on that. Well, that's because we can't see God or can't get, get him. So it's, it's on the word. God says, I'm swearing an oath. I absolute give you my promise. There is going to be judgment that falls on you. And it says, I'm going to swear on my holiness. I'm going to put my very holiness on the line here. <clears throat> If I don't do what I say I'm doing and I don't judge sin the way my nature says that I'm to do, then my holiness is at stake. And so he swears on his holiness. His holiness is his very nature. Okay? So basically, there's nothing higher that God can swear on than himself. Okay? We swear on the Bible in a court. He says, I swear on my seat. He does the same thing in, in the book of, uh, of Hebrews. He swears on himself. There is no greater to anything to appeal to than himself. <clears throat> you know, God is righteous. By what standard is God righteous? His own standard. <laughs> There's not a higher standard that he can appeal to. Now, when we're seeking to be righteous, what's our standard? Well, to be righteous like God is. <laughs> Well, God's standard is himself. There isn't a higher standard. And so for us to challenge God in any way, we're challenging the, the, the one who's the very standard of righteousness. That's why Job got in trouble. <laughs> when he goes before God complaining about this and you know, call, basically calling God into question. And if you remember, God says to him, wait a minute, let me get this straight here. <laughs> you are questioning my righteousness is that job is that right and i'm sure he starts saying "Ooh, that i didn't mean it to sound exactly that way when you put it that way <laughs> you know uh yeah you're, you're yeah you so you're you're actually the one that i created and who is known to be a sinner is actually judging my righteousness is that right no wonder he said i put my hand over my mouth i don't have anything else to say there isn't a higher standard than God. My uncle used to uh, 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 umpire baseball. He, he, didn't, he didn't go all the way to the major leagues, but he did some games way up there. <clears throat> and uh, he told me one day of a, uh, he was the first, first base. He said the first batter of an inning came up, and he hits a ball deep, deep to short. It's one, he, and it's those kind of like, oh, God, we hate it. umpires to see this kind. This thing, you already know it's going to be close. And so sure enough, shortstop, long throw from deep short to first base. And gentleman barely, barely got it. Michael says, out. Oh, he pitched a fit. You know, he comes over there, and he's in my uncle's face. The manager comes out, and both of them are saying, he was safe. He was safe. What are you doing, Colin? Said, my uncle said, hold on just a second. Hold on just a second. He was out, and I'll prove it to you. I said, what do you mean? He said, see the scoreboard up there where it says outs and there's a one under it? That's you. <coughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, folks, what else are you going to appeal to? <laughs> it's like I call them. And that's pretty much what God is saying here. I'm swearing on my own nature and on my own character. And it is pristine, pure. <laughs> and if I don't do this, my own holiness is in question. And my own holiness is not going to be in question. You can be sure on my nature as a holy, righteous God that your judgment is going to come. Yeah. Now, again, you have to remember, folks, this is Amos speaking, not God directly speaking. <clears throat> and you've got to remember from the very beginning of our study when they look around and economically, the nation is doing superbly. <clears throat> the military is extremely powerful. Uh, everything in the country looked great. And he's saying, so God's swearing on his holiness that he's going to judge us. Okay? 
Folks, that's what made Amos' ministry so difficult is that there wasn't anything that you could actually point to empirically that actually supported that they were somehow under the judgment of God in some way. Everything seemed to be pointing exactly the opposite of that. Now, <clears throat> very interesting, he says at the very last uh, there, at the end of verse 3, you're going to be cast into harmony. Well, let me, let me go back to the beginning of verse 3 first, because I think there's something the way he says it. You will go out through the breaches in the walls. Um, <clears throat> now, that's interesting, because the walls is what they were trusting. You know, no enemy can get in here. We've got the gates. No, we're closed in the wall. He's saying that very wall that you think is protecting you is going to be the breaches in that wall, the very breaks that you're going to be leaving out and going into captivity somewhere. <laughs> okay? They're going to be holes. He, he tells them right before that, boy, this is not, uh, not pretty at all. Uh, notice how you're going to be led out. This was an Assyrian practice here of, uh, <clears throat> uh, of how they dealt with the people they had conquered. They're going to take you away with meat hooks and the last of you with fish hooks. Uh, their, their policy was to put hooks through the nose or hooks through the ears and lead people up and down the streets when they got them home. This is what I captured. Look what we have done. And they would put them on display. And they said, that's precisely what's going to be happening, uh, ha what's going to be happening uh, to you. Okay? These fish hooks, that was the... Uh, 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 now remember, when you talked about the Assyrians at this point... It, the Assyrians were a relatively weak nation. And they're saying, you've got, to be, you've got to be kidding. I mean, it's like us saying, you know, the Cubans are going to come up here and drag all of us away. You say, you've got to be kidding. The Cubans? Uh, who are they? Well, that's the way the people felt in, in Amos' day. These people north of, of us, supposed to go, who in the world might that be? Well, again, it was no time after the end of, of, of Amos' ministry that uh, uh, the great leader Tiglath Pileser comes to power in Assyria and builds that Neo-Syrian empire to something to be absolutely dreaded by everybody in the east, and that happens proverbially almost overnight. You know, these people did not see that coming, and so when he's announcing these judgments of what's going to happen, they probably found it pretty humorous. You know, there's no sign of this, no evidence of this at all. Well. Look at verses 4 and 5. Uh, he is speaking here. You know, folks, we can't, you, you have to tell by the context. You can't, uh, you can't see Amos speak. You can't hear his voice. He's speaking very sarcastically here. Uh, he says in verse 4, enter, enter Bethel and transgress. Go to Gilgal and, and multiply your transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning. Bring your tithes every, uh, uh, every three days. Offer a thank offering. For that which is leavened and proclaim your free will offerings make them known and here's this oh you people just love to do that don't you you just go ahead and do it. you just love being religious without your morals for you just love to do this you sons of israel so go ahead go ahead all you're really doing <clears throat> he's saying in these religious practices you're just bringing and heaping judgment upon yourself so go ahead and do it just keep on god's just telling you go ahead go ahead you're just stockpiling dynamite, and there is going to be a huge explosion. So, yeah, just, just keep on. So when he's telling them that, you know, God's not telling them, yeah, go ahead and sin. I, I approve that one. This is okay. He, he, that's very sarcastic language. <clears throat> Husbands, it's like I've heard people say about your wives. You have to know what they say and what they mean. When, when they say, go ahead, go ahead, you better not. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, that means don't you dare. Okay, that was sarcastic. Well, he's being sarcastic here. Go ahead. Go ahead and sin. Go ahead and keep bringing your, uh, your offerings here, your, uh, your worship. Go ahead to these uh, shrines. Remember, because this is just outward religion. It's just giving them enough religion to hide behind so they can continue to do and live the kind of life they want to live and still have a little bit of... Uh, uh, religion, as I had a friend used to say, have enough religion to hide behind. That's all they've got. And that's what they were trying to do uh, here. And so he speaks of bring your offerings every third day. We really don't know of any offerings that were due every third day. So probably what he means by this 
is they were actually doing it more than necessary, more than what the law even required. You know, just keep on bringing them every third day. You might be required to do it every week. Y'all are trying to do it every third day thinking this is going to make you right with God, but it's not going to. They were going apparently beyond the law even when it came to worship. But notice their worship, their motivation was again self, uh, self-pleasing. It was there because it's something they enjoyed doing and probably a lot of it because it was self-praise. You know, everything that they were doing was somehow calling attention to themselves. You know, somebody said even religion outward can actually be a form of rebellion against God. Uh, even religion can be. Even religious activities and religion. I mean, isn't that exactly what the Pharisees were doing? You know, uh, suppose their good works out in public to make sure everybody saw them. You know, uh, giving to the poor. You know, but making sure everybody saw it. Folks, they weren't giving to the poor. They were using the poor. They were using the poor. <laughs> you know, I'm using the poor to make me look good and to make me feel good. You know, make everybody look up to me. Look how religious this person is. And so their motivation for worship was not that they were sincerely devoting themselves to God. Folks, worship that does not lead to personal spiritual transformation is not true worship folks there are people and 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 please understand i'm not saying this is true of it when we had the covid situation folks there's a lot of people they left the church and they hadn't come back you know um you're gonna uh tom rayner one of our leading southern baptists he wrote a piece several years ago i really need to find that again where he said there'll be five different types of people that don't come back to your church after covid okay that's not my point here, but my point is, uh, was one of them. Uh, it's going to be those people who just really saw worship as a form of entertainment. We just enjoy it. Now, folks, we ought to enjoy worship. If you can't enjoy worshiping the true and living God who has saved us and blessed us, you don't, there's something wrong. <laughs> but you can actually worship and enjoy that kind of thing and it not be something that's transforming the heart. You understand what I'm saying? And that's not, that's not always true, of, you know, uh, it can be true of new types of music. And I'm, we just love that. We just go and, and we just like worshiping. The question is, does it transform your life? And folks, that's what I'm saying. It's not just new. I, I've known people, um, probably in the generation above most of us that are here, uh, I think of somebody, if, if we had a gospel singing and had a, a, a uh, one of these uh, quartets, what do they call that kind of uh, music? The, um, the, um, you know, they'd come out of the woodwork to hear these people with, the, with this uh, bluegrass country. You couldn't get them to church any other time, but they loved that kind of music. And they would have thought, yeah, we love worship too. No, you don't. <laughs> you, you love that music and that kind of entertainment. It doesn't have anything about transforming your life. True worship is life transforming. Worship was not transforming these people's lives. They were using the worship to actually make themselves look better and to make themselves feel better. Uh, if you remember the story in, in uh, 1 Samuel 15, Samuel was uh, <clears throat> uh, sending Saul out to battle, and uh, he had told him, you know, there, you're not to bring anything back alive. Okay? <clears throat> uh, don't bring anything back alive. Uh, <clears throat> and... As soon as Saul comes back, characteristically of Saul, he's reporting back to Samuel. Hey, I did everything you told me to do. And Samuel said, well, it's about time. You never have before. And all of a sudden, hey, 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 hey. what's that? He said, oh, that's some sheep. He said, where'd they come from? He said, oh, oh, they were, belonged to the Amalekites. We brought them back to sacrifice to our God. Saul, Saul. Told you not to do that. But we're going to get to sacrifice them. And he said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better. Folks, worship, anything else we do, giving or whatever else we do, that is a, a distant second to obeying God because of who he is and the fact that we love him. Well, in verses 6 through 13, 
what we're going to see there, and I'll just uh, introduce that and, and leave it there, what we'll see next time, is there's about, I think I counted seven different acts here, things that happen that we normally attribute to just uh, chance, bad circumstances, or whatever else. That's like the weather, uh, not in our day, but locusts, military defeat. And, and notice every one of those, God says he's the one doing it. Remember, we've talked before about God uses secondary causes. You know, God said, I'm going to destroy you. Well, it's the Assyrians that come and do it. So was God destroying them? Yes, he's using the Assyrians. And you're, you're going to see famine, drought, blight, locusts, military, national, natural disasters, all these kinds of things are going to, and yet with every one of them, God is saying, I am doing those. And, and what's interesting here is God has said, look, I've mentioned, and you notice all of those things are bad things. <laughs> you know, nobody wants those. But it's God's way of saying, look, I tried the bad things to get your attention because I gave you good things and that didn't work. You know, the goodness of God is supposed to lead to repentance. And God says, I've done good for you. Look at your circumstances. And that didn't bring you to me. And now I'm doing all these things and doing, and that's not bringing you to me. What he's saying basically is I have tried everything to get you people to respond to me properly and you haven't done it. Uh, I can try this and I can try this, folks, and that tells us the outward circumstances will not change a person's heart. That's not going to do it. <laughs> it's going to take something within the heart. A lot of the people that are extremely opposed to God are people that have God have, has blessed very, very uh, uh, highly. It didn't cause them to turn to God. There are people that are on the other extreme. Uh, bad things happen to them regularly. It's almost like, you know, the phrase, even though born to lose, everything that happened, and they don't turn to God either. And that's because circumstances never bring people to God. And you know why? We already said it so far today. Because sin is an issue of the heart. Something has to change the heart or people are never going to turn to God. And so he leaves us there and we'll pick that up uh, next time and uh, see what God is going to say through Amos as uh, we get a little bit closer to bringing that, uh, that to an end. All right, Brother Bob.